Lord, we thank you for the saviour that you are and what you did on our behalf. And we thank you, Lord, uh, for your word, for your truth, and for your Holy Spirit that helps us to apply it to our lives. And Lord, we just pray this morning uh, that you would open our, our hearts and minds to hear from you. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who's here who's not yet a believer, or who is listening online who is not yet a believer, Lord, we just pray that you would open up their hearts to trust in you, the Lord and Savior who died for them and died for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, it's Good Friday today, and it's a wonderful day. I saw a cartoon a little while ago. It was actually probably a few years ago now, and I love what it said because it says, there's one guy in the cartoon, and he says, I hate that term, Good Friday. And the other man says, why? He says, well, because my Lord was hanging on a tree that day. And then the next guy says, and I actually need to come around here to read it. <laughs> if you were going to be hanged on that day and you volunteered to take your place, how would you feel? And the other man says, good. And then he says, have a nice day. <laughs> and this is why it's called Good Friday. This is why it's called Good Friday. Because our Lord took our place. He died in our place on that day. And this is something we all know. In fact, it's something that those of us who are believers, we know really well. In fact, we know it so well that, it, that we could even put it into the, I already know this box because of how well we know it. And think that, well, we need to go and focus on other things. But the truth is, this is the most important thing. This is the most important thing that we can ever focus on. There is nothing more significant. There is nothing more significant. And we should also never forget that the cross isn't just an entry point to the Christian life. It's not just an entry point. It is an entry point because it's how we become saved. We trust in what Jesus did on the cross. But it's also the center of the Christian life. It is the basis of our life. It is the sun around which our planet should revolve, orbit. It is the gravity around which our life should be based. And remember, Paul wrote this, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, salvation is not just a one-time event. It is also a process. It is something that has happened. When you believe, when you trust in Jesus Christ, you are saved from your sins. And it's something that will happen. Peter tells us that our Lord will appear bringing our salvation with him. But it's also something that is happening. We are being saved. We are being transformed. The Bible says that we are justified, that is declared righteous. We are sanctified, that is we are made to be conformed to his image. And then one day we will be glorified, that is when we are fully made new. And a totally perfected from our sins, totally washed clean. And the question we should ask is, is this process based on our works, on what we do? No, it's not. It's based on faith. This whole process is not based on our works. It's based on the basis of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for our sins. As Paul tells us in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, the power of the cross is powerful to those of us who believe because those of us who believe, we were actually crucified with him on that cross. Our sins were nailed there for us. And the life we now live, we live by the power of the cross, as Paul tells us. So let's examine what our Lord did for us today on that cross. Let's look at it in some detail so we can fully understand exactly what it is that he did for us. Now, we're going to look at, and start in Isaiah chapter 52. And we're going to look at the suffering servant. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can open up to Isaiah 52 verse 13. We're going to read to chapter 53, verse 3. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and he shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was 
so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. We see in this wonderful passage, the mighty servant who will redeem the people of God. And he will shut the mouths of kings. But we also see that there are two important sides to the servant. He's, in other words, he's a servant in two very important ways. And the first one is this. He is the servant of God. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. He is the servant of the Most High God. He is the servant of the King of Kings. He is the servant of the Lord of all. But what is incredible is that this man who is the servant isn't just a man. He isn't just a man. In fact, this passage shows us that he is divine himself because he, what is, how is he referred to? As the arm of the Lord. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This servant is the arm of the Lord. Now, you might think, well, Matt, that's a lot to conclude from a little bit of information about the reference to the arm of the Lord. Where do you get the idea of this meaning that this servant, this man, is also divine. Where do you get that idea from this? Well, I don't just get it from this reference. I get it from the way that Isaiah uses the concept of the arm of the Lord throughout his book. And we're not going to look at all those references. We're just going to look at a few. We can see consistently in the book of Isaiah that God said he is going to rescue people with his own arm. It is the arm of the Lord that will bring them salvation. And this theme is throughout all of Isaiah. Let me show you a few references. Isaiah 40, verse 10. Behold, the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Isaiah 59, verse 16. He saw that there was no man. Notice that? There was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation. And his righteousness upheld him. Isaiah 63 verse 5. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation and my wrath upheld me. So what we see here is again and again and again in the book of Isaiah says that it will be his arm that saves. There's no man out there that can save. It is only the Lord that can save. It will be his arm that stretches out to rescue His people. It will be his arm which achieves this. And yet then we see that his arm is referred to as this man, this servant, in Isaiah 53. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because there's no man who can say, but then there's this arm of the Lord which is a man. What is going on here? And we see that this is pointing to something, and it's hinting at something really important. That this man is no ordinary man. He is divine in some way because... He is the God-man. We, we know from other passages that he is the Son of Man, the Son of God, but we know from this passage that he is the very arm of God himself, stretching out to rescue people. And what's interesting is I, Isaiah even notes how hard it will be for some people to accept this. Who has believed what he has heard from us? A lot of people are going to struggle to believe this. And we know because we've read after the fact, we read the, the message of the Gospels, and what do we see? They struggled to believe it. I saw a, a, a Christian apologist uh, debating with a, a Jew just this week, and, and the Jewish man was struggling to comprehend the idea, just like the, those in the Bible, comprehend the idea that he was God and man. Many will struggle to see it, yet many will believe. Yet this man is the divine arm of the Lord that will achieve salvation. But he's not just the Lord's servant, he's also, the, he's also our servant. He's also the servant of many. So shall he sprinkle many nations. What's he going to do? He's going to sprinkle many nations. And Isaiah tells us it's at the very moment when he is in his most marred place, his most damaged 
experience that he's going to achieve this. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marked beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children. But what's happened to him? He's been deformed. He's been hurt. He's been so seriously hurt that it says later in the passage that people turn their faces from him. They can't even look at him. They can't even look at him. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him for that which has been told them they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Now, what does it mean to be sprinkled clean in this context? What does it mean to be sprinkled clean? It means to be made ritually clean. In the Israelite context, something needed to be made ritually clean to be acceptable. And the Gentiles, the nations, were not acceptable because they were not ritually clean. They engaged in all sorts of wrong food practices, all sorts of wrong religious practices, all sorts of unclean behavior, which made them unclean in the sight of God and unacceptable. And yet this servant is going to change this for people from many nations. He's going to make them actually clean. And he's going to wash away those sins. And this is how he is our servant. You see, the one who rescues someone in need isn't just their savior. He is their servant as well. Who likes, who likes stories? Who likes saving the princess stories? You know, the knight on his, on his powerful steed with his sword who fights the dragon. Who loves it? I love those stories. It's some of the greatest stories of all time. But what is that knight? That knight who rescues that damsel in distress, who rescues that princess, what is he? He is her savior because he's rescuing her, but he's also her servant because he's rushing to fulfill her greatest need in that moment, to be rescued from that dragon. And the Lord's servant is therefore our servant in precisely the same way that that warrior knight is the servant of the damsel in distress. And we, humanity, are in distress. We are in distress because we are damaged by sin and our rebellions. And our world is crying out for a savior. Our world is crying out for a savior. You see it all over the place. I mean, just look at what most of the big movies are about these days. What are they about? Saviors who are being sent, to, who are called upon to rescue the world. Whether it's in stories, people are crying out for a savior. Whether it's in politics, people are crying out for a savior. All over the world, saviors are being promised. And saviors are being called for. And why is this? Why are people crying out for a savior? Why are people searching for it in so many different ways? Why is it the most common form of entertainment today? Well, our world is filled with people who know they are not clean. Our world is filled with people who know they are not worthy. Our world is filled with people who know that they are rebellious. And our world is filled with people who know that they are seeking for satisfaction and fulfillment. And they know that in the places they're seeking it, they're not finding it. And it's not bringing the fulfillment that they thought that it would. All of the things that they were promised by the world that would bring them that fulfillment, it's not working. And therefore, they know they need a savior. But they need one much greater than these guys. <laughs> so God is promising here in Isaiah that through his very own arm, by his very own strength and outstretched arm, he will make us clean again. He will sprinkle us. Through his servant, that is the divine arm of the Lord, he will achieve a victory for us that we cannot achieve. And it will be a victory that is so profound that it will shut the mouths of kings. In other words, it will astonish even the greats who ponder it. So how does he promise to do this? Well, he promised to do it by bearing our sins. Isaiah 53, verse 4 to 6, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him 
the iniquity of us all. He will be stricken. He will be smitten. He will be pierced. He will be afflicted. And why is he doing this? For us. He will be stricken, smitten, pierced, and crushed for our transgressions, for our iniquities. And it's what he does that will bring us peace. And it's through what he did, and only through what he did, that we will be healed. That is the only way for us to be healed. In other words, what he did was for us. It was on our account. It was on our account. In other words, it was your sin and my sin, our sin, that held him to that cross. That's what held him there. Do you think that men could hold the God-man to the cross? Do you think that nails can hold the one through whom the world was created to the cross? Do you think that the might of the Roman Empire could crush the Lord of all? No. He surrendered. I love that song. I actually put it up online this morning. Hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered. That's what he did on our behalf. He, I mean, think about this. He acted with wisdom. Isaiah told us that. Isaiah 52 verse 13. His servant will act with wisdom. In other words, he never did anything wrong. He never spoke out of turn. Who here has got brothers and sisters here this morning? Have you done the wrong thing by your brothers and sisters this morning? We all should put our hands up. We're all kind of guilty. We're all guilty. <laughs> we're, we all protest, but it was their fault. No. But he never did that. He never did the wrong thing by his brothers or sisters. He never disobeyed his parents. He never rebelled. He never looked at a woman the wrong way. He never cussed at someone with a lack of self-control because he never had a lack of self-control. He was actually righteous. He was actually innocent. And yet we know that he who knew no sin, Paul tells us, was made to become sin so that we might receive the righteousness of God. He became sin on our behalf. He bore our sins on that cross. He took our place. And he encountered the wrath of God that we deserved so that we don't have to. And he bore those sins to his death. Isaiah 53, verse 7 to 9, He was oppressed, he was afflicted, but he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb he was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence. And there was no deceit in his mouth. Isaiah tells us, and the Gospels tell us, that he was oppressed. Now that's incredible to think about because we're talking about the Lord of all. I want you to think about what this means for a moment. It means that he was powerless. It means that he chose to be powerless. Think about that. The mighty arm that defeated Rahab was powerless in this moment. We read about this in Isaiah 51 verse 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake, as in the days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? You know, Rahab is this mighty image of this sea serpent in, in the scriptures. and it, 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 It's referring to an ancient sea serpent, which was a dragon, effectively. A mighty beast. But in Isaiah 51, this dragon actually represents Egypt. And it's using to represent the mighty nation that the arm of the Lord defeated. Do you remember what God did to Egypt? What God did to Pharaoh? <laughs> With the ten plagues and the destruction of Pharaoh's armies in the water. And we know that it was our Lord Jesus who did this, because Jude tells us this. Jude 1 verse 5, Now I want to remind you, although you were fully knew it, that Jesus, 
who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. The servant of the Lord, the arm of the Lord, was unrighteously betrayed, condemned, and murdered. He was oppressed. The innocent man who had done no one any violence, had done no one any wrong, who showed the utmost grace to the woman caught in adultery, who showed the utmost grace to the self-righteous who repented. He showed the utmost grace. Do you remember one of my favorite accounts in the whole New Testament is when a centurion comes up to Jesus (laughs) and says to him, Lord, heal my servant. And what does Jesus say? Take me there. And he says, no, 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 no. All you have to say is the word and he'll be healed. The, the grace which Jesus shows to that man and commends him for his faith, the one who was actually innocent and actually righteous in ways which no other person really is. See, of all the men who were innocent and did not deserve to die in our history and who died unjustly, he was the one who did not deserve to die the most. And yet, he was condemned like a common criminal. And now to that cross, like a thief. In fact, he was right next to a thief. He was taken against his will. Well, actually, no, he was taken according to his will, but you know what I mean. (laughs) He was bound. He was violently assaulted. His beard was torn. His skin was pierced. His blood was shed. He was spat on. He was whipped. He was degraded like the worst of men. And yet he was the best of men. And he didn't even defend himself. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. You know why I didn't open his mouth? I think the reason why I didn't open his mouth is because if he had it, it would have stopped him. Do you remember when they come to get him? And they said, they're looking for him, he said, I am here. And what do the guards do? They fall down before him. Such was the majesty of, of the Lord, even in veiled form. But he opened not his mouth. He didn't defend himself. Now, we all know to some degree what it is like to be treated unfairly, unjustly. We all know what it is like to some degree to be oppressed through no fault of our own, especially over the last few years. We've seen it firsthand. And we know what it is like to some degree to be slandered, falsely slandered, or accused. But none of us know what it's like to have to experience this at the same level as our Lord. And he did this right up until his death. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. As I said before, hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered. At the hands of the most cruel act of oppression imaginable, the cross, the innocent man who was also the servant of the Lord and the arm of the Lord died. The Son of God experienced death. The Son of God experienced his soul being torn from his body by the cruelties of a painful death beyond which we can not even imagine. I mean, the word excruciating means to come out of the cross. That's how painful it was. And it was our sins, as I said before, that held him there. See, the servant gave his wife life willingly. And Jesus tells us that he gave his life of his own accord And it was our sins that held him there. And he did this so that we could be saved. But what's important is, he wasn't just there because it was our sins that held him there. And it wasn't just that he did it of his own accord. As important as all of that is, and it is important. What's also important is that it was the Lord's will to crush him. Isaiah 53, verse 10 to 12, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. I want to ask you a question this morning. Does your sin weigh you down? Does your guilt weigh you down? Does your sin dog you and follow you and come to your mind and keep you awake at night? Maybe you handle it well most of the time. But find there are moments where you cannot, where it's just brought to your mind and you cannot get past it. Or maybe there are moments where your mind reminds you of things that you did (laughs) and you kick yourself again because you did them and they weigh on you again. Or maybe guilt affects you in some other way. Or maybe you're not yet a believer and you're watching this or you're listening to this and you feel like your guilt and your sin is getting on top of you in a way that you cannot handle. Maybe you feel the need to find a way to kind of check out and to get away from this world of sin. Or maybe you're here this morning and your life is good. Your life is really good. And you have everything you need in your life except for Jesus. You think that everything is going well. You live the comfortable middle class life and you're the envy. You live in a life which is the envy of most of the world. And you think you're completely fine with your own merits. Whichever one of these people you are this morning, the Lord died for you. Whether you're the Christian who is reminded of their sin and it keeps coming back to your mind, or whether you're the non-believer who has not yet believed and is really struggling with your guilt and cannot get beyond it, or whether you're the self-righteous person who thinks that everything is okay, that you think you're all okay, I want to tell you this morning, Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you. And he bore your iniquities so that you could be accounted as righteous. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. Out of the anguish of his soul, Jesus put himself through an incredible pain and anguish for you, for us. He did that. And by his knowledge, shall the righteous one, the only one who is righteous, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. In other words, what is Isaiah saying? He's offering you a transfer here. He's offering you a trade. He's offering you something. Your guilt for his innocence. His righteousness for your sin. (laughs) His innocence for our iniquities. His perfection for our dirty robes. Let me ask you a question. Is that a good trade? That's a pretty good trade. He's literally saying, give everything, all those wrong things you've done to him, and he'll give you a righteous record that God will smile upon and receive you on the basis of, and will make you clean in a way that nothing else can. That's a pretty good trade. So I want to ask another question. If you're watching or if you're here this morning, have you accepted this free gift? Have you accepted it? Have you turned from your sins and trusted in Jesus? Have you given your burdens over to him? Have you accepted that he can and will wash you clean from your sins if you trust in him? See, we know that he achieved this on our behalf, those of us who already believe. And we know that his promises are sure. And we know this can all be true because, and all this is so, because we know that this righteous servant, the servant who died, doesn't, didn't stay dead. God rose him again. And though he died, the Lord rose him. Rose him. Why? So that he could, what? Give his spoil 
all of those who are his people. <laughs> Therefore, I will, divide, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes transgression for the sins. So this day, what we're looking at today, it really leaves us with only one conclusion. For all of us who are here in this room this morning, and that conclusion is really simple. Repent and believe in the one who died for your sins. See, if you're already here this morning, so we are already here because you're already here. <laughs> if you're here this morning and you're already a believer, we still have to do this. There's never a day in your life in this world where you get beyond the cross. And if you do, you're in danger. <laughs> When you get beyond the cross, you're in real danger. We've got to consistently come back to the cross to continue to repent and continue to trust in him and continue, whenever we fail, to come back to that cross. That is the basis upon which he makes us righteous. But if you're here this morning and you do not yet know him, this is what you need to know. Without this, you're in trouble. Without this, you are condemned. Without the righteousness that only God can give, through his son, Jesus Christ, you cannot be accounted righteous. You cannot be made clean. You cannot be made guiltless in his sight. So my encouragement to you this morning is to say one more time, repent and trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins. And for all who do this, what is today? It's Good Friday. Let's pray. Lord, Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for everything you've done on our behalf. And Lord, I just pray that we would never forget this. And Lord, I want to especially pray that if there's anyone here listening this morning who's not sure if they believe in you, who, who know they do not, or who's listening online, or who may see this later, I just pray in Jesus' name that you would open up their hearts to trust in you. And Lord, help us to remember the importance of the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.